And I told the boys about the game. They had never played it before, and they wanted to get it, so we got home, and of course, they wanted to play it right away. What they did not realize is the game of risk takes weeks to play. It's like Monopoly, right? You're at it forever, and it did. Two weeks later, we finished this game, and I crushed them. <laughs> oh, so good, I conquered the world. You know, I hadn't played that game in a long time since I was a kid. They had never played the game, so I had a little bit of advantage, right? I knew that it took a strategy in order to win that game. They didn't even know they needed a strategy. Their method was roll the dice, hope it's more than the other team, and hope you win, right? That's that's the best that they could come up with. But it didn't work. Did I mention I won? (laughs) Right? Absolutely, absolutely crushed them. Of course, in two weeks. took two weeks for me to crush them. But you know, that's the strategy. You have to be patient in that game. It all came down to strategy. You know the old adage, it says that if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. You have to have a strategy going into things. You know, no team goes into a game without first developing the tactics by which they will win. They're what they would call a game plan. No army goes into battle without a strategy to win. No Christian also should should live the Christian life without a strategy. Here in Ephesians chapter 6, in the last few weeks looking at verses 10 through 17, we've talked about the Christian spiritual armor for spiritual warfare. And Paul has described to us here all of these different pieces. We are equipped by God with the pieces of the spiritual armor that we need to stand firm. We've talked about that. We've seen the different pieces, how they fit, what they mean, and all those things. What we haven't talked about as much, though, is our strategy in that battle. And that's where Paul goes here in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. That's where these verses come in. So I want to read these verses. Actually, I'm going to start back in verse 17 because that's the beginning of the phrase. And we're going to go verse 17 through verse 20. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Here in these verses, verses 18 to 20, Paul provides the strategy by which we wear and use every piece of armor that God has given to us. Prayer, as you probably noticed very quickly in verse 18, prayer is that strategy for battle. It is the mindset, prayer is the mindset that permeates every piece of armor that we wear. It's, I think prayer is just as much a part of the armor of God as every other piece that's mentioned here. Now, as you notice here, every other one, you know, has something ascribed to it. Belt, truth, breastplate, righteousness, so on and so forth. Paul does not equate prayer to a specific piece of the armor. Why? I think because it's essential for every piece. It makes every piece effective. It's what makes every piece fit right. It's involved throughout the spiritual armor. You've got the spiritual armor that is what? Truth. Remember, we're not putting on the item. We're not putting on a belt. We're putting on truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, hope of salvation, the word of God. We've talked through these But you know what goes through all of those? It's prayer. Prayer is what envelops all of that. It encapsulates all of those things. Here's our problem, though. Oftentimes when we talk about the armor of God, we stop at verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That's the armor of God. But notice in verse 17, there's no period after the word of God. In my Bible, it's a semicolon. The armor continues on into prayer. Read it this way. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always. 
You see that? It continues on. See, if we leave out prayer, we are leaving out the essential strategy that God has given to us that we must have in order to withstand in spiritual battle. You know what else we would be leaving out if we leave out prayer? We would be leaving out our communication link to headquarters. How important through prayer is it that we communicate to our commander in chief, God Almighty? You know, how important in warfare, think of warfare communications, that is vital. How many battles have been lost because communication was was poor? Or there was miscommunication, or somebody thought he said retreat when he actually said attack. Communication in warfare is so essential. And over the years, warfare communication has taken on different forms. Thousands of years ago, it would have been a runner or maybe a rider. And that would have taken a while for that communication either get to get back to the home front or even on a large battlefield to cover everything. Or maybe they would communicate through an instrument of some sort. You hear that drum, you hear that bugle. That's how we communicate forward. Sometimes they would use carrier pigeons or something like that. As things developed, you see people using telegraph wires. Then you see, you know, wireless radios. Now, you know, satellite communications that can happen at any part of the world. John Piper says that if we were to illustrate prayer with a piece of the soldier's gear in modern warfare, it would be the walkie-talkie. That's the piece of the armor that prayer would be, that communication link to headquarters, wherein we connect with our commander-in-chief. Now, last week in verse 17, we saw that there was a close connection between the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There's a close connection between the word and the spirit. We said that last week. The word is of the spirit. Now notice today how that segues immediately into prayer in verse 18. So the word is of the spirit, praying always. There is this undeniable connection of the word and the spirit and prayer right? These are essential parts. If you get those three things down in your Christian life, the word, the spirit, and prayer, you're off to a pretty good start. You'll be pointed in the right direction. You displace any one of those three things in your life, and you may just have a mess on your hands. So whereas the word is of the spirit, verse 18 says that prayer is to be in the spirit, So there's this essential connection of the spirit to the word and spirit to prayer. We see that come up in other places as well. Jude, verses 20 and 21, says this, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude says that we pray in the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings. (coughs) Sorry, that was a groaning. (coughs) With groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Of God. So when we are in the Spirit, it says here actually, Romans 8, 26 and 27, that the Spirit prays for us. So we are to pray in the Spirit. Now, just to clarify, the idea of praying in the Spirit does not refer to some ecstatic utterances, some sort of mindlessness that takes us into other languages. That's not what it's referring to. It's not speaking in tongues. It's not a private prayer language. It's simply that when we pray, we pray in submission to the Spirit. We are praying in the Spirit. So we are praying in a way that submits to the Spirit's leading in our life and to the Father's will for our life. That's what he's saying here. You pray in submission. So we pray to the Father. We pray through Christ, right? In the name of Jesus, amen. And we pray by the Spirit. So to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. Prayer is our strategy for warfare. It's our strategy for wearing and using the armor that God has given to us, and it's our constant communication with headquarters. 
Let's look at verses 18 and 20 in a little bit more detail here. And you'll see in verse 18 that Paul gives us some general instruction for prayer. Kind of some broad overview ideas about prayer. Then in verses 19 and 20, he gives us an example of a specific spiritual prayer request that he has. A specific request that he has for the people. So first off here in verse 18, let's look at these general instructions on prayer. He says, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Praying always. Always. Our first general instruction would be this pray with frequency and fervency. Pray with frequency and with fervency. Praying always. What verse does that bring to mind? Maybe 1 Thessalonians 5 17, where Paul says, Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Praying always. Now, does that mean that I have to always pray so much so that I can't even eat, I can't even play ball with my kids, or I can't do anything else because the Bible says pray without ceasing. It says praying always, so therefore, no, it doesn't mean that. What it means is you are to be in a spirit of prayer. The Greek word there for always means on every occasion. On every occasion, it is good for you to pray. We should always be in a spirit of prayer. What it means to pray without ceasing is that you can pray at any moment. Any moment, any situation that you're in, every season of life, prayer is appropriate and prayer is necessary. What it's telling you is that there will never be a time in your life when you go through, maybe even we sang that song earlier, Spoot Hour of Prayer, right? It says, in seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. So in seasons of distress or of grief or of the tempter's snare, what do you do? You run to prayer. You run to prayer. What this is telling us is there is never a moment where you say, I don't really need to pray about that. I'm okay. I, you know, I've got this. I don't really have to talk to God about this specific thing. What it's telling us is every moment of our lives is an opportunity for prayer. It's an opportunity to go before the throne and seek his, his guidance, his wisdom, his help. And what does that teach us? It teaches us our utter dependence on God. There's never a time when you can say to God, hey, it's okay, I've got this this time. I don't need your help right now. No, we are utterly dependent on the Father. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. I think that all prayer and supplication kind of highlights different types of prayer, different types of prayer. You know, how many times when we go to pray, when we go to pray do we pray kind of boring? You know what I mean? You open the prayer in the same way, you close it in the same way, and you basically say the same phrases the whole way in the middle. Anybody else have that idea? I, I struggle with that myself. You know, the same thing, and we, we tend to be kind of stuck in a prayer rut. And you know, we teach our kids to pray, even, even teaching our kids to pray before they themselves have, have professed faith in Jesus Christ, because we want that habit to be there. And Gideon, when he prays, he, he for a while, you know, it's, you, for a kid, it's usually dear Jesus. And then, you know, they, they make their request and they say amen. And Gideon would usually say, dear Jesus, thank you for whatever it was. That's usually how it opened his prayer. Well, recently, he just, he's, he's gotten in a habit and he's just left out the Jesus part. And he opens his prayer with, dear, thank you for the whatever. I, I, I've told him a couple times, dear, thank you. Who's thank you? Dear, thank you. But he's six, okay? So we're going to let that one slide for now. It's okay. But just to, you can get in that habit where you're eventually not even thinking what you're praying. You're just words are coming out. And so here, I think this is helpful for us when he says with all prayer and supplication. And then we take into consideration what we read earlier in our scripture reading, 1 Timothy 2, 1, where it says, therefore, I exhort first of all that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. You realize there's a lot of different ways in which to pray or different types of prayer. Here he uses the word supplication and in 1 Timothy 2 as well. What is a supplication? It means to beg. It means to make requests to God. God, I am asking you to. That's a supplication. But that's not the only way we come to God in prayer. 1 Timothy 2 mentions intercessions. 
We intercede to, inter, to, to uh, pray in, an intercessory prayer is to pray on someone else's behalf. That's what we read in Romans 8, 26 and 27, that that's actually what the Spirit does on our behalf, that he intercedes for us. When we don't even know what to pray, the, pr- the Spirit is praying on our behalf. We can pray intercessory prayers as well for each other. So I'm going I'm to step in and I'm going to intercede for them. Maybe they're in a position when they, where they cannot at that moment. And you need to step in and intercede to God on their behalf. 1 Timothy 2 also says giving of thanks. You know, I think that might be the forgotten element of prayer sometimes. The giving of thanks. You know, prayer is not just asking for what we want, but praising God also for what he has given When's the last time that in your prayer time you said, you know what, I'm just going to give God thanks through this prayer. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We praise you for. Thank you, God. You know, that's prayer too, showing our praise and our thanksgiving to God. So there's several different types of prayer. Then also think there's several different ways to pray. You realize you can pray silently? You can pray silently. You can pray loudly. You ever done that? Hey, you're at your wit's end, and you're just crying out to the Lord. I don't care who hears it. I don't care who's around. I pray, I'm praying loudly at this moment. You can pray privately. You can pray publicly. You can pray vocally. You can pray secretly. You can pray abruptly. You ever done that? Somebody cuts you off in traffic and you say, Lord, help me. <laughs> Lord, help me quick. Right? And it's like all of a sudden I wasn't like in the spirit of prayer. I wasn't anything. I just went straight to it. Lord, I need your help. Whatever that might be. You pray abruptly. Is there, this is the question, is there any time you can't pray? Think about it. Is there any time you can't pray? Well, that wouldn't be appropriate there. It wouldn't be right. Well, since you can pray silent, there might be some situations, you know, where you're not going to blurt out a prayer because of the situation you're in, but you can still pray silently. And God still hears those prayers. He knows the thoughts of our hearts. And so there's never a time when we cannot pray. Prayer is always appropriate, and that's what he means here. When we are to be praying always, we are always in a spirit of prayer. And notice where he goes next here in verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful. To this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, being watchful. So pray with frequency and fervency. Pray with alertness. Pray with alertness. Romans 13 says, it is high time to awake out of our sleep. Wake up, Christian. Pray with alertness. This is so important. So important for spiritual warfare. Because it does not matter how much armor a sleeping soldier has on. It doesn't. It does not matter if the armor is shiny. It does not matter if he's doubled up on every piece of armor. It does not matter how much armor a sleeping soldier has on. You have to be alert. You have to be awake. In 1836, the the Texans won the decisive battle of San Jacinto, and they defeated, the, the Mexicans won their independence from Mexico. You know why they won that battle? It wasn't because they had great resources. It wasn't because they had, because they had so many more uh, soldiers than, than the, uh, the opponent did. They won in large part because in that battle, they caught General Santa Ana and his men during their afternoon siesta. They were asleep. They were not ready. And the Texans won their independence because of that. You know, I wonder when Satan or even our own flesh draws us into sin, it is probably at least partly due to us not being alert, not being aware of what is going on. Be alert for Satan's schemes and attacks, and you do what? You go straight to prayer. Be on high alert for your own pride and the the, the ease with which you are drawn away into that and go straight to prayer. Be alert for opportunities for prayer. Be alert for occasions for prayer. Be alert for people saying something to you and you saying, you know what, I can, I can go to prayer right there. I can pray. Some of the best advice I ever got, and I think I've told you this before, is the phrase, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now. You know, because our default setting, if we're not careful, is this. You hear something and you say, I'll pray for you. And then you forget. And so you may have just lied to them. 
Or we see somebody and we think, oh, I remember their need. Hey, we've been praying for you. Have you? Have you? Did you remember to pray for them? And so for me, the best way to say, I've been praying for you, I'm going to do it right now with you in person, and we're going to pray right now. Be alert for occasions for prayer and do it right there on the spot. What did Jesus tell his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, you guys stay here. I'm going to go off on my own for a little bit. You stay here, watch and pray. Watch and pray. He goes off for a little bit. He's in deep agony in prayer. Then he comes back to his disciples, and he finds them what? Conked out, asleep. And he says, could could you not do that? Could you not pray for just a little bit? And he says, watch and pray. And he walks off again, and he's in deep agony and distress, knowing what's coming for him. He goes back to his disciples again, and what does he find them? Asleep. They're zonked out. It was the disciples, probably the disciples' biggest event of their lives was, was upon them. And they went to sleep. They were out. Now, the disciples' shining moments were not in the Garden of Gethsemane. We saw that last uh, week with Peter, remember, getting his sword out and cutting off the ear. But a few months later, the disciples got their act together. After Jesus' resurrection, the apostles had learned their lesson. And you see it throughout the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verses 24 to 25, they pray when they're choosing Judas' replacement. Peter says, basically, let's pray. See who God wants to give to us. Acts 2.42, they lead the early church to be in steadfast prayer as a church collectively. Acts 4, 23 to 31, they gather the church to pray for the Spirit's boldness. They've been under persecution. Peter and John have been imprisoned. And the apostles come together and they lead the church in boldness to pray so that they could preach the gospel. You know, they had learned, though they learned it the hard way, they had learned to be ready instantly in prayer. There's a lesson there for us as well. The third thing he tells us in verse 18 is to pray with perseverance. He says, being watchful to this end with all perseverance, with all perseverance. What does that mean? Don't give up. Don't give up in prayer. Keep praying. Luke 18, 1, Jesus taught his disciples to pray always and not to faint. Don't give in. Pray. Keep praying. Why do we have to keep praying? Because we want prayer. We want to pray and God immediately give us that answer. God immediately respond to us. But victory in prayer usually takes longer than any one of us would, would desire. Is that true? You found that to be true? I have. It's definitely true. Faithful, persevering prayer in our lives, it builds our trust in God as we wait patiently for what God wants and what he wants in his timing. Our problem is we usually treat prayer more like a vending machine, right? We wish prayer was a vending machine. I put in my money, I punch the button, and I get what I want, all right? It doesn't work that way, does it? We put in our prayers, God punches a button, and he gives us what he wants or what we want. It doesn't work like that. Prayer is not a vending machine. Prayer would be more like a retirement account, right? You put in, and you put in, and you put in. And God in his timing gives you the dividends. God in his timing, patiently waiting, gives you the dividends from what you've put in that whole time. It might not be a perfect analogy, but at least gets us thinking. That we can't assume that immediately, that's why we have to pray with perseverance. Keep on praying. Now our continual prayer is not that we're twisting God's arm in some way, or we are forcing his hand, that if I just keep praying, God eventually has to do it. No, rather we are the ones learning and changing through consistent prayer. God is teaching us to continue earnestly in prayer, as it says in Colossians 4 verse 2, to rely on his timing and his will and not to rely on our own timing our own will. Warren Wearsby says, keep on praying until the Spirit stops you or the Father answers you. Keep on praying till the Spirit stops you or the Father answers you. How could you apply that to your life? 
in what areas do you need some persistent prayer? I think the first one that comes to mind is praying for the salvation of our loved ones. Don't give up. Don't give up. Well, I just don't think they'll be saved. You don't know that. You don't know that. So you keep praying. Because maybe God is using your persistent prayer to bring them, to draw them to Christ. So you keep praying. Pray for revival. Pray for revival in our church, in our community. And when you pray for revival, you better be ready to be what? Revived yourself. Pray for our government. You know, if there ever seems like a hopeless prayer, (laughs) that may be it, if we're honest. But yet it's a prayer that is actually commanded by Scripture. And so we pray, and we pray perseveringly for our government. Don't stop praying. The time to quit praying is always tomorrow. The time to quit praying is always tomorrow. You don't stop. You don't stop. Lastly here, in the last little phrase that he gives us at the end of verse 18, he says, pray, uh, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We pray with others in mind for all the saints. Saints are believers, not specialized groups of Christians. They are all believers. That's the saints. And what do all saints have in common? Every single saint Every single place has this in common. We are all in spiritual warfare. Therefore, we all need prayer. No matter who it is, no matter where they are, if they are a saint, a believer in Jesus Christ, they are in spiritual warfare. Therefore, they need our prayer. Philippians 1, 4, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. 1 Samuel 12, 23, Samuel says, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. It is a sin not to pray for one another. You ever thought about it that way? Samuel says, I would would be sinning against the Lord if I ceased to pray for you. It is a sin not to pray for one another, to be prayerless in our relationships with others. Now, qualification here. Does that mean that I have to pray for every single prayer request that I see posted on Facebook, whether I know the person or whether they're this place or that place or whatever? No, I don't think so. Because I don't know about you, I don't have the emotional capacity to do that, to take on all of those throughout the world. But here's my commitment. I will pray for you. And I must pray for you. Why? Because we are in this together. That doesn't mean I'm not going to pray for somebody else, but my commitment, the the majority of my time, the emotional capacity that I have to handle is dedicated right here. And we pray for each other and we lift each other up in prayer. Our prayers are not supposed to be centered on ourselves. Our prayers are actually supposed to be centered on the brethren, each other. But if we are honest, the majority of our prayers are probably for what? My life, my work, my family, my future, my well-being, most likely. And that's not the pattern we see in Scripture. You can pray for you. You can can pray for your family. You should. But in all of that, don't forget the others that you are to pray for as well. Back to 1 Timothy 2, our Scripture reading. Did you see the wide net that it casts regarding prayer? He says that we are to pray for all people. Prayers, supplications, giving of thanks for all people. And then he says in verse 2, pray for government. And then in verse 4, it talks about God's uh, desire for all people to be saved. Pray for salvation. And so that's a wide net that God is casting, or that we are being instructed to cast in our prayers, and it's all what? Away from us. It's all away from us. Another example would be Matthew chapter 6. How does Jesus open the model prayer, the Lord's prayer? He says, our Father, our Father. He's bringing a collective nature to this prayer. Not just me individually in my little bubble, but our Father. We are in prayer together. Quoting Warren Wiersbe again, he says this, if my prayers, I love this quote, if my prayers help another believer defeat Satan, then that victory will help me too. If my prayers help another believer defeat Satan, then that is partly my victory too. Why? Because now they're stronger. And as they rub off on me and we interact with each other, I'll eventually be stronger too. 
So my prayers are helping them defeat Satan. We need to pray for each other. We need to ask others to pray for us. And that's exactly what Paul does next. Look at verses 19 and 20. Paul gives us a specific application of prayer. He gives his prayer request. He says, hey guys, as you're praying for all the saints, here's a request for me. And there's a lot we can learn from Paul's prayer request here. He says, basically, pray for me in these ways. First, pray that I would speak the gospel boldly. He says, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul says, pray that I would speak the gospel boldly. He asked that he would have utterance given to him. A little unique word there to use. Utterance is the Greek word logos. It's translated there, utterance. It means to speak or it means the message of what is spoken. So Paul is asking here that when I open my mouth, I would have something to say. Pray that God would give me utterance. That when I open my mouth, I would have something to say. In our social media culture today, in our celebrity culture, there's a lot of people that open their mouth and have nothing to say. You ever heard somebody say, well, I just feel like I have a platform and I need to speak on that platform. It doesn't matter if you have a platform if you have nothing good to say. So Paul here is saying, I just don't want to open my mouth. That's not the goal, to open my mouth and start talking, but actually to have something to say. Now, this is very similar to what Jesus prays for or, or says that will happen with, for his disciples. Luke 12, 11, and 12, Jesus says that when you stand before the authorities and you're being accused for your faith, the Holy Spirit will give you what you need to say. And Paul is asking for something similar here. He's saying, Lord, when I open my mouth, when I have opportunity, Lord, give me something to say. You ever had that quick prayer? You're talking in that conversation or somebody's sharing a story, or somebody's sharing a problem, and your head's going, I don't even know what to say. Lord, help me know what to say. Lord, help me know what to say. So Paul's prayer is for boldness to speak the gospel. Boldness to speak the gospel. The boldly here is not connected to opening his mouth. The boldly is connected to making known the mystery of the gospel. Most of us have no problems talking. Our problem is talking about the gospel right? Speech is not our problem. Good speech is usually our problem. It's easy to open your mouth. It takes boldness to speak the gospel. Most of us will say a thousand words, but not one word about Christ. We'll say a thousand words, but not one word about Christ. He says, our job is to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, He's been talking about that throughout Ephesians. We saw it back in chapter three. What is the mystery of Christ? What is the mystery of the gospel? He says, we know it. It's the death and the burial and the resurrection and what God has done through Christ to reconcile people together and to bring people from all over, all over the world together in Christ. And we are, we are a new creation in him. It's this mystery that the unbeliever has not a clue about. No idea what that means. But the believer does. Paul says, we know the mystery. It's no longer a mystery to us. We know it. Therefore, he says what? We have to share it. Being bold with the gospel is taking what you know of Christ and sharing it with someone who does not know of Christ. And that's what Paul's praying here for. Now, secondly, if we look at this, we can see one of the applications he's giving us here is that we would use the circumstances. He's praying. He's asking them to pray for him to use the circumstances he has been given. Use the circumstances he has been given. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul says to us that because of what Christ has done in us, we are now ambassadors of Christ to others. It's a great word, an ambassador of Christ, one sent out by Christ to others to bring them to Christ, seeking to bring other people into reconciliation to God. Paul was an ambassador for Christ. His life after conversion, that's what he does. He travels the Roman Empire. Now, Paul is a Roman citizen. He's free to travel about the Roman Empire, and he used that to his advantage. He traveled all over the place as what? An ambassador of Christ. Multiple journeys of thousands of miles, sometimes by foot and sometimes by ship, and all these different things that happened to Paul as an ambassador of Christ. However, now, when he's writing Ephesians, he's in a tough spot. 
What do we know about Paul when he wrote Ephesians? He's imprisoned under house arrest, chained to a guard. He's chained to a guard. He's limited. Doesn't have a whole lot of freedom. His trial's upcoming. A lot of things going on for here for him. But notice in verse 20, what does he call himself? He says, pray for me, verse 19, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which, the gospel, I am an ambassador in chains. What was he without the chains? An ambassador. What was he with the chains? An ambassador. The chains have not changed his calling. The chains have not changed his calling. His present condition didn't change his mission. He's still an ambassador in a different way, in a different spot, but still an ambassador for Christ. And Paul's prayer request here is extremely insightful for us because he does not ask for the people to pray for his release. He asks them actually rather pray that God would use my imprisonment, use my current circumstances for the cause of Christ. Paul knows that even though I'm in a tough situation, even though my setting has changed, my calling hasn't. I have to ask myself, do I pray that way? Do I pray that way? Do I ask others to pray for us, for me that way? Do I pray for others that way? And the answer is what? Usually not. Usually not. Our first prayer is usually, Lord, change the bad circumstances. Instead of, Lord, use the circumstances. Now, just to be clear, can we pray for God to change circumstances? Absolutely, we can. And Paul, in fact, does that in several places. Romans 15, 2 Thessalonians 3, and Philemon 22 are a few places where Paul actually asks for prayer for the, a change of his circumstances because in those situations, he's fearing for his life. And he doesn't want his ministry to end. And so he's telling people, please pray for me that I'll get out of this situation so that my ministry can continue. All right? So we can pray for those things. But let me ask these questions. What if instead of only praying for a change of circumstances, we instead also prayed for God to use our circumstances for the cause of Christ? Have we ever stopped to think that maybe that is the reason he's given us those circumstances? What if, ponder this, put some thought behind this question. What if our circumstances became a reason for ministry instead of an excuse not to? What are we usually guilty of? Well, if I only, if I only had that, well, if I could, right, or if I had that, or if I were able to, then I would do it then I would. If only, then I would. But Paul gives us an example here that actually maybe our circumstances have given, been given to us for ministry, not to keep us away from ministry. See, we give excuses as if somehow now is never the right time. Somehow now is never quite the right time. There's always something that leads us away from that. You know, there are examples throughout history of people that were in difficult circumstances and God used them greatly. John Bunyan was locked up in a Bedford prison. He couldn't get out and speak and preach like he wanted to, so you know what he did? He got out his pen and some paper and he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Talk about using a bad situation and turning it into a good situation. Corey Tenboom was stuck in a concentration camp, yet she became and, became and, and used that as a great opportunity to share the love of Christ with somebody. See, Paul shows us that our greatest concern in prayer is not the ease of our life. We usually think that, I gotta pray because I gotta make my life easier. Our greatest concern in prayer is not ease of life, but rather that in every situation we would win spiritual victory. That in every situation, every circumstance that God gives us, people would be saved, lives changed, sins forgiven, temptation avoided, spiritual fruit produced, faith would mature, dependence on Christ would be exhibited, there would be submission to the Spirit. That's why he gives us the circumstances that we have. Maybe his last phrase helps sum it up. Look at the very end of verse 20, the third thing he asks. He says that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul prays, help me do what I ought to do. Help me speak as I ought to speak. 
And I think this was the phrase that hit me between the eyes this week in preparing for this. Paul knows the reason he's been put in prison. He knows the reason he's had these circumstances. And he says, Lord, help me to use it. Help me to do what I ought to do. It's the same exact language he uses in Colossians 4.4. 4. He says, help me to speak as I ought to speak. You know, I think we should pray that same prayer. But I think we could even be wise to extend that a little bit. Lord, help me to do what I ought to do. No, that's a phrase I tell the boys all the time. Usually not in a you know, completely level tone of voice where I'm really calm. But sometimes if you would just do what you're supposed to do. And I think how many times does our Heavenly Father look at us and say, if you just did what you're supposed to do. In a much more loving and gracious way than I do to my sons. But how many times, think about this, how many times, how much better would our life be? How much more fruitful of a Christian would we be if we just did what we ought to do? What are the ought to's in life for a Christian? What are the things for us as believers we ought to do? If you've got a list, if you've even got a couple of them, guess what? Do them. That's, what you, that's Paul's prayer here. Pray that I would speak as I ought to speak. Hey, pray for me. Pray for me as your pastor that I would do as I ought to do. Because I'm going to pray that for you. That you would do as you ought to. You know, you don't, know, you don't have to know everything. But I guarantee we know what to do. I guarantee we know that there are some things, we just got to do this. Prayer is one of those for the believer. Prayer is certainly one of the ought to's of scripture. You have to. Because in the spiritual armor, prayer is the strategy that guides our fight. It's that communication link that connects us to headquarters. I would say prayer is as essential as the helmet or the shield or any other thing in the armor. In fact, in many ways, prayer is the way that we wield the sword. Do you notice that? Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always. How do you wield the sword, the Word of God, effectively? Pray. Pray from Scripture. Pray the Word of God. I don't know what to pray in my life. I don't, have, I don't have a prayer request list. Yeah, you do. 66 books of prayers. And you can pray and say, God, help me to do what I ought to do. Help me to do what's in your word. We're going to transition to communion. I'm going to call the, the men forward to help serve communion. And as they're coming forward, just a few words and comments. <clears throat> 